Office Space is one of the most relevant satires of the 9 to 5 office life, and the film had a huge influence on the general view of work in the modern era. From relatable characters, iconic scenes and quotes. Hello, Peter. What's happening? Sounds like somebody's got a case of the Mondays. Sounds like a case of the Mondays. <laughs> when you come in on Monday and you're not feeling real well, does anyone ever say to you, sounds like someone has a case of the Mondays? I believe you get your ass kicked saying something like that, man. Office Space has become a definitive 90s comedy that many still love and appreciate. Maybe you've seen the memes, and it was through its deadpan style of comedy that the film so accurately captured the absurdities of corporate life and work in general. Mindless tasks, overbearing bosses, poor work-life balance, and most of all, that longing for freedom and fulfillment in an endless cycle of monotony. Audiences resonated with all these dreaded aspects of work, and the film to this day serves as an important reminder to constantly evaluate how we spend our time. We don't have a lot of time on this earth. We weren't meant to spend it this way. Human beings were not meant to sit in little cubicles staring at computer screens all day. Today we will explore the lasting impact of office space. Office Space came out in 1999 and was written and directed by Mike Judge, known at the time for his animated TV series Beavis and Butthead and King of the Hill. It was his first live action film and it was based on his own experiences as a frustrated office worker. The film follows Peter Gibbons, played by Ron Livingston, a young office worker who works at a software company called Inatech. He's underpaid, has an overbearing boss, and he hates his job. Peter undergoes a hypnotherapy session that gives him a realization that he should stop caring so much about work and live life on his own terms. He starts arriving late, starts wearing whatever he wants, and he doesn't do shit at work anymore. With his new attitude, he gets a new girlfriend played by Jennifer Aniston, and he also devises a plan with his friends to infect the company's computer system with a virus that will over time give them small fractions of money that would add up to hundreds of thousands. And along the way, they brutally beat their despised office printer in the middle of a field. I don't want to spoil the rest of the movie for those who haven't seen it, but that's the basic plot. The film bombed at the box office, only making 12 million over a 10 million dollar budget, largely because it was a hard film to market and wasn't promoted very well. Mike Judge said he hated the poster and the trailers for the film. It makes sense that movies are made to escape the real world and in the eyes of viewers, no one really wanted to see their own work life in a movie. PC load letter? What the fuck does that mean? According to Judge, a studio executive straight up blamed his movie itself for its failure, telling him nobody wants to see your little movie about ordinary people and their boring little lives. However, the film later caught on through word of mouth after its release on cable and DVD, and has since become a cult classic. It's constantly quoted by fans, there were memes on social media, Office Space just struck a chord and it finally gave a voice to all 9 to 5 white collar workers. And this genre of workplace satire later became more popular in TV and film, with shows like The Office and Parks and Recreation. And Office Space even influenced the more recent show Severance, which explores the concept of a work-life balance with an interesting sci-fi twist. Something that made Office Space so special was the way it found humour in the mundane. It was not only a great comedy, but also an accurate portrayal of work and what makes it suck for a lot of people. Things like getting stuck in traffic on the way to work and getting an electric shock first thing Monday morning to introduce you to what a horrible week you're about to have, dealing with obnoxious bosses, boring repetitive work and petty annoyances like irritating co-workers, a printer that doesn't work, and dumb corporate jargon. Not to mention the monotony of the 9 to 5 lifestyle, spending long days hunched over a computer in a depressing cubicle, followed by a night where all you have energy to do is crack open a beer and chat shit on the couch. These frustrations and dreaded aspects of office life were addressed in such an offbeat and deadpan way. Dry humour with weird, somewhat exaggerated characters. And it was this humour that made it resonate so well with audiences who had similar experiences at work. In a way, it was cathartic for those who hated their jobs and felt powerless, like they could live vicariously through these characters rebelling against their bosses and destroying a printer. I, uh, I don't like my job, and uh, I don't think I'm going to go anymore. The film is obviously a comedy, but underneath the surface, there's definitely some serious contempt for corporate life on Mike Judge's part. Some might even say that the movie is kind of sad how accurate it is. It's like it's a comedy until you actually work in an office and can relate to Peter. In the film, Peter represents the average white collar worker who feels unfulfilled in life. Despite having a stable job, he's bored to death and has that existential frustration that a lot of people experience at some point in their careers. He feels trapped and this makes him miserable. On the other 
other hand, Peter's boss Bill Lumberg represents all the worst aspects of corporate bosses and corporations in general. First of all, he looks like a tool, but he's condescending, passive aggressive, and micromanages his employees with no regard for their concerns or their well-being. Lumberg represents the larger corporation that essentially uses its employees' labor for its own greed and sucks their soul in the process. And the film overall depicts the revenge of the average powerless worker against the corporation. At first, Peter victimizes himself to Lumberg and Inatech. He thinks he's trapped and destined to live a depressing existence forever. But once he has his hypnosis, he realizes that he's actually the one in control and he's free to live his life however he wants. So his solution is to stop caring and put his own needs and interests above his employers. It's not that I'm lazy. It's that I just don't care. Most people will say that the themes of office space have barely aged, and nowadays we've become more aware of the problems with work that the film deals with. And this attitude of rejecting a mundane work life has almost become the norm. Fans have even told Ron Livingston that the film inspired them to quit their jobs. I mean, people will come up to me from time to time and say, you know, this movie and you were the reason that I quit my job and, and walked away from my livelihood. <laughs> wow. I'm always a little, I, I wait five seconds before I say good for you you because I don't know which way it went. In the 1990s, there was already a growing disillusionment with the idea of a traditional corporate job. People were fed up and had already started to demand a more creative and progressive work environment with a better work-life balance. And I don't know what happened, but in 1999, the movies just went crazy on the whole idea of corporate job equals bad. Office Space, Fight Club, American Beauty, and The Matrix. All these films had some kind of common theme of corporate disillusionment and pursuing bigger or more important things in life. It was something of a crisis in corporate America at the time, and that sparked a cultural turning point where people were learning through pop culture to turn their backs on conformity and reclaim their identities. And Office Space in particular played a part in starting conversations that have led to all the recent changes in the modern workplace. So how has work changed since 1999? Well, the world of work is constantly changing, but of course the biggest change has come from advancements in technology. It's created endless opportunities for employees to communicate and collaborate more effectively, and it has enabled companies to reach wider audiences through things like social media and online marketplaces. But when we look at the last 25 years, it's pretty clear that one of the other main things that we've changed, or that we're trying to change, is our attitude towards work in general. Generally, corporate life is met with a negative stigma. It's often seen as boring and soul-sucking. There are rules and systems and toxic corporate hierarchy. It's very serious and fun is not allowed. Look at all this fucking bullshit. Mm, yes, mm, very serious. Society as a whole has recognized this, and a lot of workplaces seem to be trying to work on this. A lot of the changes that have happened came in the 2000s, after Silicon Valley tech startups did things a little differently and redefined how we approach work. Here are some of the examples of our changing attitudes towards work. Instead of boring ass cubicles, the last two decades have seen the rise of more open and collaborative workspaces that create a more relaxed and fun environment. Ping pong tables are also put in a lot of offices nowadays, you can go play a game with your friend when you both get sick of work and need a break. When it comes to dress code, business attire like suits and ties were once the standard at most offices. Nowadays, most companies are pretty laid back with dress code. As long as you look neat, you can dress pretty casual and wear whatever you're comfortable wearing, which is another thing that creates a more laid back environment when employees actually look like normal people. It's crazy, but people can actually do their jobs regardless of what they wear. My boy Zuck is living proof that you don't need to wear a $9,000 suit to be productive at work. Speaking of Zuck, new technology has also paved the way for more opportunities to be your own boss. This general disdain for the corporate office life and the need to escape the 9 to 5 has reached an all time high. Well, it's just a weird standard that we've all accepted pretty much across the country. 9 to 5, 9 yeah. to 5, 9 to 5. And a lot of people are turning their backs on the traditional work lifestyle. Firstly, there's online freelancing where people can hop from job to job, set their own rates, and create their own schedules. Or people are deciding to start their own business and become their own boss entirely. And with that, you of course have hustle culture. Here in my garage, just bought this uh, new Lamborghini here. You see, the rise of social media has spawned a culture that pushes people to spend every waking moment working themselves to the bone. I swallow every piece of gum. What? I've swallowed every piece of gum that I've ever chewed in my life. I think it's efficiency. I don't think I want to give up the hundredth of a second putting in a napkin. What you just said 
is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. Nevertheless, I would say the general attitude is still leaning towards the work to live mindset. Most people still want a work-life balance and don't want work to dominate their lives anymore, especially in recent years. After COVID, employees started to reevaluate their careers as well as what mattered most to them. This led to the great resignation in early 2021 when over 47 million workers in the US quit their jobs at the same time. Everyone collectively had a Peter moment and just peaced out. Some found better jobs, others might have just taken a career break, maybe they sat at home and played Minecraft all day, who knows. On top of that, in 2022, the concept of quiet quitting went viral on TikTok. People aren't going above and beyond, they're not bending over backwards for their employers anymore and sacrificing their mental and physical health. Quiet quitting. It's like when you quit your job, but you just like, you don't actually quit, you just do as little as possible. Oh yeah. It's a big trend now. Gen Z is ditching hustle culture. There's this concept of quiet quitting where people are coming to work and they're just doing the minimum, doing their hours, doing their job, not volunteering or raising their hands or going, and that's it. And it raises the question, is that bad? And so it seems to me like after COVID, people just stopped giving a fuck. People started to realize that they weren't cared enough about at work to emotionally invest in their jobs anymore. And in turn, this caused employers to reevaluate their company cultures and values to actually, you know, care about their employees. Companies now have a huge focus on flexibility and well-being in order to keep their employees happy and keep them engaged. Fun activities and social events, company perks, and just more of a general appreciation for each individual employee are some of the things they're doing to improve improve company culture. They're learning that creating positive vibes and keeping everyone happy directly contributes to the morale of the workplace and of course makes it more likely for their employees to stick around. And lastly, as we've seen after COVID, employees can now work from home and still communicate effectively with each other thanks to technology. Flexible work arrangements are now the new norm after companies finally learnt that working from home can actually improve work-life balance and increase productivity. This is another thing that keeps employees happy because it helps them maintain a work-life balance. Now to go back to the film, unfortunately some of the problems it deals with are timeless and haven't changed. But the film raises an important question about the meaning of work. At the start of the film, Peter asks his friends, what would you do if you had a million dollars? While it sounds like a meaningless question, the point of the question is really to get them to confront their dissatisfaction and figure out what they truly want in life. And that line captures the subtle existentialist perspective of the film that reminds us that we are responsible for our own lives. In an interview from 2019, Ron Livingston said, The movie, at its heart, is about a guy who is miserable doing all the things he's told he's supposed to be doing. And really, the only thing that happens in the movie is he gives himself permission to do those things and to try and figure out what does make him happy. There's something about that that's timeless. It goes against everything we're taught. Don't quit. Make the best of a bad situation. It's something that really resonated and still resonates. It makes people feel empowered about their lives. And so as cliche as it sounds, the film tells us that we have to push boundaries a little in order to stay true to ourselves and what makes us happy. And 25 years later, I think this sentiment is more relevant than ever with all the changes we've seen in the modern era. No job is perfect, work will always be work, and while it is a significant part of our lives, it is not the be all and end all of our existence. I don't know why I can't just go to work and be happy like I'm supposed to, like everybody else. Peter, most people don't like their jobs. But you go out there and you find something that makes you happy. Yeah. So I like to think that office space is a good reminder that life is short. I'm going to end this video on a really cringy note, but fellas, go out there, make your life your own, and don't waste any time doing shit that makes you miserable. And also like and subscribe on your way out.